Hello, everyone. I'm glad you can attend Attitudes ADHD Experts webinar. Today's topic is nutrition and ADHD. Most parents raising kids with ADHD are willing to try a wide range of treatment options, including nutrition, to help their child manage symptoms. Just to be clear, poor eating habits do not cause ADHD. And when it comes to controlling impulsivity, inattention, and other symptoms, medication and behavioral therapy are probably the most effective approaches. Still, parents have reported a connection between the kinds of foods their children eat and the behavior and symptoms. Now science is beginning to add credence to those observations. Dr. Sandy Newmark is here to talk about the benefits of nutrition in improving symptoms. You will learn about foods that might be causing harm and key nutrients your child might not be getting enough of. You'll also get the lowdown on food dyes, gluten sensitivity, and how it all relates to ADHD. Dr. Newmark is clinical professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and director of client services at the Osher Center of Integrative Medicine. He treats children with autism, ADHD, and other childhood conditions, combining conventional medicine with nutrition, behavior management, and other complementary approaches. Just a note here, Today's webinar sponsor is Play Attention, Enhance Brain Health and Performance. Play Attention is the most comprehensive neurocognitive training program available designed to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. But technology by itself is not enough. The mind also grows with good nutrition, exercise, coaching, counseling, mindfulness, behavior shaping, and parent training. These are all components of the Play Attention system. Call 800-788-6786 and learn how they can customize Play Attention for you. Their website is www.playattention.com and when you call or go online, request a free professional consultation. Now before Dr. Newmark makes his presentation, I'd like to conduct a little poll here. What is your primary connection to ADHD? One, helping a child you care for with ADHD. Two, helping yourself or another adult with ADHD. Uh, are you a teacher? Are you a professional with patients or clients with ADHD? Or other, number five. While you're taking the poll, I'll mention a few things about our webinar interface. The widgets on your screen are completely resizable and movable. You can submit your questions through the Q&A widget. Dr. Newmark will answer as many questions as time allows. So now let's see the results of the poll. Okay, as expecting, helping a child, expected, excuse me, helping a child I care for with ADHD, um, and also a professional with patients. Those are the two that sort of lead the, uh, lead the poll. So with all that being said, let me turn it over finally to Dr. Newmark. Thanks for being here, Sandy. Well, I'm happy to be here. And I want to thank everybody for uh, spending your valuable time here. And I hope we can make it worthwhile. So I'm going to talk about nutrition and food and ADHD. Uh, in the past, this was uh, something that resided in the realm of alternative medicine, but it is now rapidly becoming more mainstream as more and more scientific studies show that nutrition really does have a role in ADHD. And uh, I want to say that this is really true whether a child is taking medications or not. This, uh, this is not to say, this whole uh, webinar is not to say, oh, you should substitute nutrition for medication or you should substitute nutrition for uh, behavior therapy or working with your school. Uh, there's many things to me in an integrative approach to ADHD that are important, but, um, but nutrition really is a, a basic one. And I think you know, whether a child is taking ADHD medication or not, it's important that they have uh, the right uh, the right nutrition. 
Now, that said, it's also true that it's impossible to predict uh, the role of nutrition or how greatly what a child eats will affect their behavior because children are so different. Um, there's a lot of different genetic and environmental factors in children which, which modify how they respond to diets. So, for example, there may be children who can have a Pop-Tart for breakfast and they go to school and pay attention and they don't have any problems. For other children, that makes a big difference in whether they can pay attention or not. And one of the most inter interesting things going on in science right now is that we can see genetically which kind of uh, genetic variations influence the kind of nutritional needs a child might have and how they might respond to certain uh, nutritional factors. Now, that's something that's really in its infancy, and it's not at the point where we can say, oh, take this lab test, and then you'll know what your child has to eat. But I think we'll get there sometime where we can truly have personalized medicine that'll show us what our particular child uh, is able to eat or should eat. So for now, we're just going to talk about general rules for ADHD children, general kind of suggestions, and then when you apply them in, in, your, in your own case, you'll see what works and what doesn't. So first we'll start with general nutritional principles. Probably the most important thing that I can tell you about nutrition and ADHD kids is to be aware of the glycemic index and of giving smaller amounts of sugar and highly processed carbohydrates. So what's the glycemic index? It's simply a measure of how fast carbohydrates turn into sugar in your bloodstream because that's what we do with carbohydrates, any kind of carbohydrate. We turn it into sugar. That's how, how we live. The brain actually needs sugar glucose to work. However, highly processed carbs like white flour or white bread turn into sugar very quickly in your system. And what happens is it makes your blood sugar go up quickly. Now, your body doesn't like that. So what, they, what your body does is it produces certain hormones to drop that blood sugar back down. And in general, if it goes up too fast, it will go down too fast. And then what you're going to see is low blood sugar. It'll go down past normal to low, toward to the low end. And then you, what goes along with low blood sugar is jitteriness and hyperactivity and difficulty paying attention in some children. So what you want to do is avoid the sugar and the processed carbohydrates. So as I wrote right there on the slide, the worst breakfast ever, maybe, you know, it's probably worse, but a common one that I see now is frozen waffles with syrup. Now, when you make a waffle, you're making out of flour that's been highly, highly pulverized. So the enzymes can get to it very, very quickly, the digestive enzymes. So that turns into sugar really quickly. Then you're putting sugar on it in the form of syrup. And what you've got is sugar. I mean, I, I've often say you might as well take a funnel and put about 12 teaspoons or 20 teaspoons of sugar in it and pour it down a child's throat because that's what it's gonna, it's gonna turn into very quickly. So that's one thing, really watch the carbs. Um, the other thing is avoiding all artificial colors and flavors. We know that artificial colors and flavors cause hyperactivity and decreased attention in all children. Or should I say that it causes it in some children, even those who don't have ADHD. Like, as I said before, in some kids it probably doesn't cause a problem. But I can't tell you the number of parents who have told me that they notice if their child gets red food dye or yellow food dye, they go off the wall, they go out of control quickly. In Europe, this is so well accepted that on 
foods with certain artificial colors, there is actually a warning label. It says, "Do this food will cause your child to be hyperactive and less attentive or something like that. Uh, our FDA hasn't seen fit to do that. But there's really no reason to have artificial colors or flavors in a child's diet. They have no advantage. So I would really just watch out for them. Um, I also wrote that, especially for breakfast and lunch, because that's what's most affecting how your child does at school, you really want to try and give the optimal nutrition. Uh, dinner is not quite as crucial because they're only going to go to sleep afterwards, but it doesn't mean you give them junk food. A lot of times it's where they get a lot of their uh, nutrition. And then, you know, it's okay to relax on weekends over special parties and that kind of thing. It's, um, I think it's important not to be too dogmatic, you know, never let your child have a dessert or never let your child have this or that, because that re I think that can result in resentment and rebellion and uh, possibly even uh, uh, eating disorders later in life, although we don't know that scientifically. So it's, it's okay to, you know, to give a little ground uh, for special occasions on weekends, a dessert or day, that kind of thing. So what are foods to avoid? So white bread, crackers, chips, cookies, except for the one dessert, all those things you want to try and not give them is any more than you have to. So any kind of soda, even diet soda. You know, um, current research has shown that giving diet soda with aspartame or one of those artificial sugars actually increases craving for sugar. So I would avoid those completely. And even juice, although in some ways it's helpful being made directly from fruit, if it is that kind of juice, we really try and limit it to one cup a day because it is a really uh, high sugar, a uh, high sugar food. Pasta, uh, pasta is a little less high in the glycemic index than white bread, especially if it's uh, not cooked too much, if it's al dente, as they say in Italy. Um, so you want to avoid a, 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 f a meal that is sort of just pasta, or maybe with some butter on it or something. Now, I think pasta if served with a protein, like, you know, pasta with chicken or pasta with other meats or fish, shrimp, and, you know, some vegetables and stuff can be part of a really, uh, a really healthful meal. But I, I hear of too many kids who just, you know, dinner will be pasta with a little butter on it. That's just not a good meal. And then pr processed meats like salami and bacon, those are uh, those have uh, preservatives like nitrates and nitrates in them, and they actually are known to cause cancer eventually, not in children, but a lifetime of eating them will increase risk for cancer. They do make those that are preservative-free, and those are better. But you don't want a very heavy a diet very heavily based on, on processed meats. That's also uh, something to avoid. Well, what do we want to encourage then? What what is your child supposed to eat? So proteins. Proteins are very important. They're digested slowly. They don't cause a sharp increase in blood sugar. And they're very important for building muscle, for building bones, for any kind of growth. So, of course, meat has protein. Soy has protein. Dairy has protein. Beans. I put beans in red there because they are just such a terrific food. They are high in protein. They're high in fiber. They uh, are low in calories. They are cheap they're easy to make and eat. So I really, I think people just don't think about beans as a protein source enough. Lentils especially have a very high protein content. Seeds are really good too, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, and nuts. Nuts are not quite as high in protein, but they're still very healthful. Uh, they have uh, healthful fats, they have uh, protein, 
They have some fiber, and they're really good. So that's the protein sources I would look at. The other thing is healthy carbs. So what's a healthy carb? I said real whole grain bread. Now, what does that mean? Well, what I mean by that is a real whole grain bread is made out of just whole unprocessed grains. Because you will see something that says whole wheat bread out there on the supermarket shelf. And, and all it is is it'll, it'll have a little bit of whole grain bread and the rest of it is just white bread. It'll basically be the same consistency as white bread, but it'll be dyed a little, it'll look a little brown. A really good whole grain bread, you should be able to see the seeds and fiber in it. And if you squish it in your hand, then it shouldn't crumble into a little tiny ball like white bread will, but will really have some resistance. Um, and it should have only whole grains, organic if possible. And those, those are easy to get. They pretty much sell those anywhere now. So those are important. Whole grain cereals are great. When you get cereals, you want to make sure there's not a ton of sugar in them. So many cereal has, cereals have high amounts of sugar. Um, vegetables, of course, are very healthful. I know a lot of kids don't like to eat them, but they, they really are uh, a quite healthful food, and it's good to work with them. Fruits are helpful too. I know. I know that uh, I met a lot of people recently who, because they're avoiding sugars, tend to try and avoid fruits as well. And I wouldn't do that. Fruits have many highly uh, desirable quantity, qualities, and especially antioxidants. Fruits are full of antioxidants: blueberries, strawberries, all those different colors in fruits are different antioxidants that are tremendously important. We actually know that kids with ADHD are low on antioxidants. So I would keep on uh, eating fruits and try and balance with some vegetables. Um, now, I wrote smoothies are your friend. Why is that? Because smoothies, in my experience, are a really good way to get very nutri good nutrition into kids easily. Um, you can take a smoothie uh, with a base of some high-protein yogurt, like Greek yogurt, add a whole bunch of fruit, uh, and you have a healthful drink. Some kids will even eat them with vegetables added. You can add fruit and even a little bit of spinach. If you have a Vitamix, that's great, you know, but any kind of good food processor will work. And uh, some people even uh, add uh, supplements and, you know, protein powder or something like that to uh, smoothies. I think one of the tricks is to have your child help with the smoothie and start with it very light. Don't start a smoothie adding everything you can think of and expect the child to drink it. Just uh, ask them what they would like in a smoothie, you know, and like, you know, oh, do you want a strawberry drink? And you know, make it with strawberries, and you can even use a little sugar in this and uh, and uh, make it uh, smooth and with that, and make it light, and then you can start working with the kind of smoothies they will eat. So that's a really good thing. Um, I didn't write down on this slide about fats, but I should really talk about their health. Fat is also something that got a uh, bad reputation, but Fats are actually really, really important. You have to have good, healthy fats. We'll talk about one particular fat called omega-3 fatty acids uh, in a little while, but just um, the kind of fats you use in, in daily uh, cooking is, are really important. Olive oil uh, is, one of, uh, is a monounsaturated fat. We like monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats the most. Uh, you can have some saturated fat that's in, uh, say, dairy or meat, but you don't want to have an overabundance of that. So I encourage people to uh, really look at uh, cooking with uh, and putting on your salads like olive oil or uh, uh, canola oil or even almond or walnut oil. All of those oils are, are really good and very helpful for the brain and the body. So the question comes up whether to eat organic or not. We do know that non-organic foods have high pesticide levels. 
And studies have shown that high pesticide levels are correlated with ADHD. Not necessarily that they cause ADHD, but that they may really contribute. One study showed that children whose urine had higher than normal pesticide levels were twice as likely to have ADHD. So there is a link between pesticides and ADHD. We also know that if you eat organic fruits and vegetables, that will lower the pesticide load significantly. Um, now, there are no studies that prove that going organic will improve ADHD. We don't have that study yet. But I actually recommend that when you can and when it's within your budget to use as many organic foods as possible. Now, lately, lately, the last five to 10 years, you don't have to go to Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck, like we used to call it, um, to get organic foods. You can get lots of organic foods at Trader Joe's, which is where I shop a lot, at Safeway, at Costco or Walmart. They're, they're really coming up everywhere. So I said, just looking around and seeing what foods you can get that are organic that you know won't break the budget and, and working on those. Now we'll come to something different, elimination diets. Many children with ADHD are sensitive to certain foods in their diet. And these foods make them hyper and decrease their ability to pay attention. They accentuate every one of their ADHD symptoms. Now, this has been shown in study after study since the 1980s. And what happens is we put in these studies, they put children on an elimination diet where they only eat several foods and they, and they evaluate their ADHD and it gets better. And then when they give them the uh, foods they eliminated again, their ADHD gets worse. So we really do know this to be true. Some kids, as I said before, this is different for every kid. I put most of my hyperactive kids, not just the inattention kids, not the inattention kids so much, but the kids who have combined hyperactive inattention, ADHD, on elimination diets whenever I can. And maybe a third to a half of them respond. So it's not everybody. But sometimes the response can be really dramatic. And the only way to know is to do an elimination diet. There's many kinds of elimination diets. I have one where I remove the foods, usually for three weeks, sometimes a little more. It's important to remember that these children are generally not allergic to foods, the way an allergist would determine allerg allergy by a skin test or if we did a blood test. There are tests that claim to show food sensitivities, but in my experience, they are not accurate enough to rely upon. So really, you have to just try the elimination diet and see. So what you do is you eliminate all the foods for a few weeks, the ones that I suggest, which are usually wheat, dairy, corn, soy, eggs, nuts. And you see if your child has improvement in their ADHD symptoms. And then if they do have improvement, you start adding them back one by one to uh, to see which food it is. Now, sometimes the reactions are dramatic, sometimes they're mild to moderate. And even if they are sensitive to a certain foods, it doesn't mean they can never have it again. It depends on their reaction. Sometimes they can tolerate it, you know, at a party occasionally, but people see really high value in uh, eliminating that food. Now, there is something called omega-3 fatty acids I talked about. These are a kind of fat that is crucial to brain function. Now, why they're crucial is this is the fat that actually lines the nerves that uh, are in your brain. And when omega-3 fats are lining these nerves in what we call the myelin sheath, impulses can be transmitted quickly. That's what they do is they help increase the transmission of these impulses. If you don't have enough omega-3s in your diet, what's going to happen is that your body will use another kind of fat called omega-6s, which are found in 
and breads and soy and all kinds of carbs to replace those omega-3s, and then you will have slower transmission. Omega-3 fatty acids are mainly found in fish. There are non-fish omega-3s, for instance, in flax or chia seeds. Sometimes you'll see eggs that claim to have omega-3s. But all of those are in precursor form, and your body has to convert those to the important omega-3s in order to work. And not everybody can convert them. In fact, some people, lots of people can't convert them at all. So the really reliable way to get omega-3s is to eat fish or take a fish oil supplement. Now, I know that uh, many children are not going to eat fish like five times a week. And so then I, uh, I recommend fish oil. And multiple studies have shown that fish oil is beneficial for ADHD. This is one of the most studied supplements for ADHD we have. Studies, what we call meta-analyses, where they put all the studies into one bag and then they use the statistics uh, together. All of these confirm that uh, omega-3 fatty acids can be really helpful for ADHD. So unless your child is a major fish eater, I recommend that as a supplement. That reminds me, though, of talking about children and fish. A lot of people ask me, "Well, how do I get kids to eat what you're telling what you're telling me they ought to eat?" My child likes to eat macaroni and cheese and pasta and milk, and that's all they'll eat, you know. And and what am I supposed to do? Well, it can be hard. I definitely know it can be hard, and sometimes these dietary changes can't be made all at once. But it is your responsibility to feed your young child what's helpful for them. So my, the, the maxim I like is that it's your job to offer your children the foods you want them to eat. And it's their job to decide whether to eat them or not. So what's this means, what this means in practice is you don't offer them foods that you don't want them to eat anymore. In other words, if you think they eat... Uh, too many crackers or white bread, you stop offering that, and you offer something healthful instead. And if they eat it, they eat it, and if they don't, they don't. No child is going to suffer from missing a meal or two. And eventually, almost all of them come around. And as I say, you don't have to do this all at once, but it's really important to start moving toward a healthful diet. And you don't have to worry about your child starving or getting sick because the, their intake goes down for a while as they adjust to what you're offering. So that's really uh, important. Uh, Sandy, I just wanted yeah. to interrupt you for one second. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, about adults. Do these same nutritional principles apply to adults? With ADHD? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, good question. Okay. So. I believe these same nutritional principles apply. Now, most of the research in ADHD and, and all of the research that I know of, of ADHD and diet, or most all, is done in children. So I don't have the research uh, at, uh, behind me to say that, but I don't see any reason to think these same principles wouldn't apply in adults. Okay. A little thing uh, about fish oil. It's available in large capsules, as, as many of you have seen, the big giant ones, and smaller capsules, liquids, and gummies. The problem with the gummies, although they're very attractive, is that they have very little omega-3 in them. And they generally, unless you're going to give like 12 gummies a day, it's not going to work. What you want to look for is the total amount of EPA and DHA. Those are the crucial omega-3 fatty acids that are in uh, the product you're getting. And it can vary dramatically, even in the same amount of fish oil. And I gave you some uh, just general guidelines there for what might be appropriate doses. Another thing that is important is iron. Iron is very important for normal brain function. And now that's not so, well, not being anemic is important too, but even in kids who are not anemic, who have enough uh, iron in their red blood cells, 
When we measure ferritin, which is the circulating iron, the iron going to your brain in a different way, that is really crucial for ADHD. And we know that kids with ADHD tend to have low ferritin levels, and that if you give them ferritin, if you give them iron, they actually get better. There's a number of studies showing that, and we can even see the pathways by which that works. The problem is a lot of people just get a finger stick or something where they check the hemoglobin and hematocrit, and they say, oh, my child was checked, they're fine. Well, that just checks for anemia. That does not check ferritin. So my advice is for everybody to ask your pediatrician to draw a lab and get the iron, and as I'll talk about in a minute, the zinc level as well. So, and I also check a vitamin D because so many kids are low. As I said, zinc is important. Low zinc levels are correlated with ADHD. In, in one study, uh, which was very interesting, they took kids who were taking a stimulant for ADHD and they added zinc. And when they added zinc, they were able to decrease the amount of stimulant for optimal results pretty significantly. And when you can decrease the amount of stimulant the child needs, you're doing them a service because it'll decrease the side effects if they have any, and um, it's a good thing. You can try zinc-rich foods, uh, meat, shellfish, legumes, seeds, and nuts, but also uh, it's pretty easy to give a supplement if, if it's low. Um, I did want to tell you a story. Uh, I just was re reminded about this. There was a, one child I saw who had very significant ADHD. He was getting 50s and 60s on his tests, and his mother was really ready to, wanted to start medications, uh, but in her mind, she wanted to check off everything else that she could possibly do just to feel better. And so she came to see me, and we put this child on an elimination diet, and the results were just dramatic. Almost within a week, his grades started to go up, his attention started to go up, he was le having less behavioral problems, and it turned out with him, uh, gluten and casein were the most, uh, most uh, uh, significant offenders, but there were other foods that actually bothered him. And what mom said to me was so funny. She said, you know, I just came here to check this off. If you would have told me that, that he was going to respond that well, I would have thought you were lying. So um, she was a real skeptic about it, and yet it worked very, very well. Multivitamins. Many children with ADHD lack antioxidants. They're under something called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress means that you're, when your body metabolizes, it makes these, uh, these toxins, these free radicals, and it takes antioxidants to take care of them, to sort of wipe them up. And if you don't have enough antioxidants, you're under oxidative stress. Now, I believe if a child eats a really good diet with lots of fruits and vegetables from, with different colors, they don't really need to take a multivitamin. But so many children don't. And if they don't, a good multivitamin may be quite beneficial. Okay, so I think that's uh, where I'm going to stop. And, okay, um, okay. and uh, I am uh, ready to answer questions. Yes. Um, a lot of parents have talked about... Um, sugar and trying to eliminate it from their uh, children's diet. They ask about sugar substitutes like stevia or honey or something like that. Is that um, harmful or will it not improve the ADHD brain or will it compromise the ADHD brain using those instead of sugar? Yeah, yeah. so there's a, a lot of information. You have to uh, distinguish between two things. Um, artificial or uh, alternative sweeteners that are literally not sugar, and then something like honey or brown sugar. Honey is, is just has sugar in it. Although it may be healthful in some ways, 
it still has all the sugar in it and will do the same thing to your blood sugar. So that's not really a substitute. And there's absolutely almost nothing better about brown sugar than white sugar. It's maybe a little less processed, but those are, those are just sugar. On the other hand, you have uh, artificial things like, not artificial, but uh, alternatives. One is stevia, which is relatively new to the world. Um, not to the world, uh, it's been used in uh, you know, certain places in South America for a long time, but it's just sort of hit the market. As far as we know right now, it's a pretty reasonable substitute, but um, it's new. And I'm, I've seen too many times where after five or 10 years, research starts coming around, it shows that it's, that it's not really as healthful as we thought. But as far as we know now, it's okay. And then there's sucralose, uh, which is Splenda. And that is art artificial in the sense that it's an alcohol sugar and it's just not digested. And it's reasonably healthy, although in a lot of people it causes loose stools or even diarrhea. So Stevie is probably a little better than Splenda. And then I would emphasize you really want to stay away from the true uh, artificial uh, sugars uh, like aspartame. You know, uh, those are definitely not good for you. They can cause neurological symptoms. As I said, they actually can increase the brain's uh, need and desire for sugar. So you want to stay f away from those completely. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We've had several parents ask. We've had several parents ask um, that they have a very picky eater, son or daughter, and they want to know how to. Um, I know you mentioned smoothies. I mean, I'm talking about a couple of them mentioned they only have uh, three to five foods they'll eat. So they're looking for strategies to get some kind of nutrition into their kids. Uh, is there anything else other than smoothies that you've come across? Well, yeah. So there's a couple of things I'd say to that. That's, you know, those kids uh, who, if they just have ADHD, um, who only eat three to five foods are pretty much on one end of the spectrum. And they may take some really, you know, I think they're going to need to work with uh, a feeding therapist who's usually an occupational therapist. Uh, feeding mm -hmm. therapists can really work with a family to kind of to kind of um, increase the amount of foods uh, kids will eat. Um, so I and also nutritionists because kids are eating three to five foods are probably not getting very good nutrition. Uh, the other yeah. places, I mean, I guess those kids are probably aren't eating soups. The other thing besides smoothies, where you can hide lots of stuff as soups. And another one is, is in pasta, for instance. A lot of kids eat pasta. And uh, I have parents who, who uh, let's say, chuck up, chop up um, cauliflower so fine you can barely see it and put that in the, in the meat sauce or other vegetables. And often kids will eat that. So you need to be uh, creative. There's a book out there called Deceptively Delicious, which has a lot of recipes like that. But, uh, What's the name of the book? I'm sorry. Deceptively Delicious. Hmm. Okay. But um, for most kids, by applying the principle of uh, your job is to offer them food that you would like them to eat, and their job is to eat what they would like to eat, eat what they want to eat, that usually works really well. Yeah. A couple of these parents, I just want to just sort of get closure on this. A couple of the kids have sensory problems, <clears throat> and that's sort of limiting their, and ADHD, so that's sort of limiting, limiting the range of foods that they'll eat. So yeah, I would and, imagine, and, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this is also true of kids with autism who I work a lot with who have very, very limited diets. And so that's where you really need a team. You need your pediatrician, you need your nutritionist, and you need a good feeding therapist who can help you work through that. Because sometimes what the parents are doing to try and get their kids to eat other foods is actually counterproductive, kind of trying to force it on them or bargain with them. And there's ways to do that, especially for kids that have sensory issues that you should have a good feeding therapist to help you work with. 
Those are usually mm -hmm. a field of occupational therapy. Okay. Now, I know you mentioned limit sugar. Someone wants to know should is it, who might be measuring that by reading food labels, et cetera, is there a, a maximum of sugar that a, that a child or an adult should have in a day? I mean, yeah, I know avoiding so, all of it. Oh, yeah, ahead. so th there's lots of different opinions. For adults, often people talk about five teaspoons or 25 grams of mm -hmm. uh, sugar a day. And that's probably not a bad idea for kids either. Maybe it can be a little more lenient. Um, there's sometimes people say that uh, women should have less sugar than men. I'm not sure why that is, except maybe just because they're smaller. But if you would be in the realm of five or six teaspoons, there's five grams in a teaspoon. So it's 25, 30 grams of sugar a day. That would be very reasonable. But mm -hmm. think about this. I mean, some of one big soda, one like, say, 32 ounce or something can have 100 grams of sugar in it. 100, 20 teaspoons or even even mm -hmm. a even a, a, a 16 ounce Coke or 12 ounce Coke. You just it's like 13 teaspoons of sugar. So now imagine instead of giving your child a Coke, or uh, any other soda, you take us some water and you one by one put 13 or 14 teaspoons of sugar in that water. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it's like. So we have a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of sugar in our diet. And just doing the simple things like eliminating soda and too much fruit juice and highly sugared things uh, can make a dramatic difference. Uh, lots of questions about eggs when you mention protein sources. So I wanted you to talk about that a little, if you could, because it, it seems like a lot of the parents are, are serving serving eggs to their kids to get some protein uh, in addition to meats. But eggs have come up quite a bit in the question panel here. Oh, good. I'm glad that came up. Hold on a second. I just want to see something. Um... Yeah, I apologize. I forgot to include eggs in my list of proteins. That should definitely be there. So um, my apologies about that. Eggs are, eggs are kind of a good example of the limitations of our nutritional knowledge. Back, you know, 20 years ago, everybody was saying, oh, my gosh, you can't eat eggs. They're, they have too much cholesterol. They're really, really bad for you. Stop eating so many eggs. And then several years after that, it said, oh, no, actually, the amount of cholesterol you eat isn't as important as how much saturated fat you eat, and eggs are really good, and eggs don't increase your cholesterol. And just recently, again, a different study came out and said, well, maybe eggs really do increase your cholesterol. So it's one of those things that have gone back and forth. Basically, I think a reasonable amount of eggs is a very good part of a child's diet. They're healthy. They have iron. Uh, they're easy to get down in most kids. You can, another thing that you can put in various forms. Um, so I actually uh, think it's a good thing. Now, would I give a child two eggs every single day? Probably not. I would probably try and vary it a little bit. But I would say, you know, six to eight eggs a week is probably fine for a child. Mm -hmm. What about the fine gold diet? Uh, does that uh, does that seem to hold up over the years? Or uh, several people have asked about that. Um, so Ben Feingold was the first doctor who really made it widely known that diet could really have a significant effect on ADHD. And I, uh, I really admire him for that. He thought two things. He thought sugar was really bad for ADHD, or three things. He thought artificial preservatives were really bad for ADHD. And then he thought salicylates were bad for ADHD. Now, we've talked about the sugar. We've talked about the artificial colors and flavors. So all of that I totally agree with. The salicylates is a kind of an interesting thing. The problem with salicylates is they come in really healthy foods, fruits, berries have very high amounts of salicylates, tomatoes, certain vegetables, lots of spices. So eliminating salicylates, which is what you do on the fine gold diet, 
is uh, real work, and it also uh, takes you away from lots of fairly healthy foods. My experience is that only a small percentage of kids with ADHD are actually sensitive to salicylates, but it is a few of them. And um, I remember one child who we put on an elimination diet, he had ADHD, and in about a week, mom called me and said, he's 10 times worse, what have you done to him? What is, you know, is worse, why is he worse? And it, I said, well, what is he eating now? And she, he said, well, when I eliminated all the other stuff, all he wants to eat is berries, which are like the <laughs> highest salicylate foods there are. So when we took that child off of salicylates, he really improved. So there is a small percentage, and it's certainly fine to see if you're one of the children who is sensitive to salicylates. But I wouldn't go on that diet, you know, kind of open-endedly where you – you know, you just say, okay, salicylates are bad for kids. I'm just going to keep them off. What I would do is when your child is in a, uh, when your child is in a stable place with his other dietary things, well, you know, maybe you've done a regular elimination diet or you've just changed his diet or her diet to make her more healthy, then try a trial of two or three or four weeks without, with, you can't be actually without salicylates because they're everywhere, but on low salicylate diet. And if that works for you, great. But if it doesn't, then these are healthful foods, and I would uh, I would go back to them. The mm -hmm. Fine Gold, uh, there's still a Fine Gold organization, and their diet is, you know, they have a, a good website, and you can learn lots more about it there if you just Google Fine Gold Diet. Um, how do you spell salicylites? S A S A L I C Y L A T E S. Okay, I think a few people want to um, Google that. Uh, another question about what should be checked in a child with ADHD in terms of blood work. You mentioned okay. zinc, ferritin, vitamin D. Anything else? This one person asks. Yeah. So my basic, if there's nothing else that's suspicious, is a blood count, CBC, ferritin, zinc, vitamin D. And sometimes I check uh, something called anti-gliadin antibodies. Those are, those are antibodies that some people who are uh, sensitive to gluten uh, produce. And if those are high, that's a very big clue that you're sensitive to gluten. They're called anti-gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N antibodies. Now, the problem with it is that if you don't have them, it doesn't mean you're not sensitive to gluten. So I would still do the elimination diet, but it, it's something that if it's positive, it really focuses your attention and makes it more likely that people will do it. So I'll often check that as well while I'm at it. But mm -hmm. um, often if you ask a pediatrician, they'll be pretty reasonable about getting a CBC, ferritin, zinc, and vitamin D. Mm-hmm. And what about, is there a place for gluten-free foods? Oh, yeah. I mean, when you do your elimination diet and if you find your child is sensitive to gluten, then you're going to use gluten-free foods. I mean, I mean, it's kind of funny what people la label gluten-free foods. You know, you'll see a broccoli and it'll say gluten-free. Well, of course it's gluten-free. <laughs> it's broccoli. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. so many things <laughs> right. are labeled gluten-free, you know, kind of in a silly way. But, you know, when you see, you know, bread or crackers or things that are gluten-free, I mean, that's meaningful. The trick with gluten-free is you really have to look. I mean, because some of the gluten-free foods are not very healthful, especially the gluten-free breads. Uh, you know, often they're made out of just uh, um, things that are flours made with that, that don't have protein, that don't have uh, any nutrition at all. So you want, to, you want to really look carefully at the kind of substitutes you do get. For instance, if you're trying to substitute for crackers, you know, they have brown rice crackers. Those are good. You know, those are healthful, like brown rice um, or veg vegetable crackers or something like that. Um, there's lots of really interesting snacks out there these days. I mean, they're a little pricey, but, you know, you can get kale chips or you can get potato chips that are type chip type things that are just made with the vegetables. You know, they don't have any gluten, they don't have any flour at all. 
And, and those are good. I mean, you have to look carefully and see what they're giving you, but some of them are actually quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone piped up here, mentioned gluten-free foods tend to be more processed, added oil and sugar to overcome removing gluten. So I guess people have to be careful. Read labels, maybe? Yeah, that's exactly right. You really have to eat, eat labels and try and move it. Like if you're a child who's eating bread like three times a day, rather than um, moving toward gluten-free bread three times a day, try and move to other foods. You know, you don't, you don't have to eat bread all the time. Um, try and have uh, much more healthful snacks than crackers, say. You know, have hummus for a snack or carrots dipped in yogurt or something like that. So be creative so that you don't have to just buy gluten-free, you know, flour stuff. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to know about the connection between vitamin D and ADHD. What? Um, there's there's I don't... not as much research on vitamin D and ADHD, but there are a couple of studies indicating that lower vitamin D levels are associated with ADHD. And vitamin D is something we have, a, it, it's low, it is below normal in many, many children. And um, part of that is kids don't, you know, you get your vitamin D from the sun. Kids don't get out in the sun as much as they used to. They're inside a lot more. Also, if you put on sunblock, then your uh, body can't absorb vitamin D. But of course, we want to put on sunblock to prevent cancer. So in the end, many kids with, are actually vitamin D deficient. And that seems to be associated with worsening of ADHD. Although, as I said, the research on that is kind of on the, uh, it's just sort of starting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell everybody another story, though, now that I'm thinking about it. There's, um, just to show how dramatic changes in diet could be, there is a, a, a school in Wisconsin, a high school, um, which was a school where they sent the very most difficult children, not just children with ADHD, but children with you know psychological problems and emotional issues, kids who'd been in trouble uh, with the law. You know, these kids had were really difficult kids and with lots of problems in school and out. And what they decided to do in this school is to change their diet. Now, these kids were all there for breakfast. So they had breakfast and lunch at the school. And they simply removed the vending machines that were selling soda and chips and all that kind of stuff. And they brought in an outfit called uh, Whole Ovens or something like that to make their breakfast and lunch. And that's all they did. And the change in that school was dramatic. Everybody from the principal on down were talking about how the kids were more attentive. They, had, they were doing less fighting. Nobody was getting expelled. It was really, the kids themselves loved it. It's really a dramatic thing. And um, mm. just to show you that, and this didn't even involve any supplements. And, and the kids, you know, it wasn't like a really, it didn't involve eliminating any foods. It was simply uh, changing the diet to a healthful diet and getting rid of the junky food. Mm. So we can all do this. Yeah. Yeah, I have to ask about a keto diet because so many people have asked about that, and it's so popular and in the mainstream these days. So I don't know how that <clears throat> registers on the terms of feeding your ADHD child, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think if you're going to do a true keto diet, you need a nutritionist and you need to be real careful. I mean, because true keto diets have so little carb that it can actually change the electrolyte balance in your body and, and it can be toxic. On the other hand, a mm -hmm. lot of what people are talking about in keto diet is just kind of a very low carbohydrate diet. And... Mm -hmm. um, if it's that, I think is okay to try. I've, I've used it more in my children who have autism than I have in just ADHD. Um, and mm -hmm. sometimes you see benefits. One of the things is that, you know, I say a lot of children are, are sensitive to gluten, 
But there are kids who are sensitive to almost all the grains. And when you get rid of those grains, as you do in a keto diet, um, then they do better. Again, I see it more in the autism world, but I, I see no problem with uh, trying a sort of mild mm -hmm. keto diet, not the true keto diet, and getting rid of all the grains, right. for instance, uh, and seeing how it works. Again, you want to give it a try. Don't just stay on it forever because it sounds good. And give it a try. If it's helpful, stay with it. If not, uh, then don't. It's difficult. Okay. Okay. And this. I think this will be the last question. It's about ferritin again. It says uh, the person is asking, your slide says low ferritin can worsen ADHD. So is it that the low ferritin is an indicator, an indicator for ADHD, or is it that you have ADHD and you're more likely to have low ferritin? I think it's the I latter, think no? It... No? No, um, not. I, um, I guess I, I would say that we... We know that low ferritin is associated with ADHD. I think okay. the ADHD comes first and the low ferritin second, because we know mm -hmm. that kids with ADHD actually tend to have lower ferritins, although many of them don't. The thing to remember about ADHD yeah. is it has multiple causes, multiple genetics, multiple environmental causes. I could give a whole other webinar on the, the genetic and envir environmental contributions to ADHD. So when, when we look at this, there are certain kids who don't who have low ferritins, and if you treat them, they get better. Probably in them, um, whatever caused their ADHD also caused their low ferritin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that has to be it. That the hour is up. Um, actually, we might have to bring you back for the environmental causes. I sort of like that idea. <laughs> Not causes, okay. but associations. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a really a fascinating. Future. It's a fascinating yeah. area um, because uh, it's such a. Um, Oh, the disease comes from such a multiplicity of factors, it's hard to say what's happening with any one ADHD child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks so much for being here, Sandy, and uh, sharing your expertise. I found it enlightening. I'm sure everyone else did as well. And, well, uh, you're welcome. It was really my pleasure. Again. Okay. My pleasure. Great. Great to have you. And thanks Thank to you. all of the other attendees for being here. Uh, just a note again about today's sponsor, uh, Play Attention, Enhanced Brain Health and Performance. Play Attention is the most comprehensive neurocognitive training program available designed to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. But technology by itself is not enough. The mind also grows with good nutrition, exercise, coaching and counseling, mindfulness, behavior shaping, and parent training. These are all components of the Play Attention system. Call 800-788-6786 and learn how they can customize Play Attention for you. Their website is www.playattention.com and you can request a free professional consultation. Uh, next week on April 9th, Rick Fiery will be talking about engaging career, career paths excuse me, for teens and young adults. He'll be giving parents and teens a detailed roadmap to finding a great career and the best types of schools and training to make it happen. So we'll see you then, and have a great day, everyone.